Okay, Mike, one of the things I guess that's really key before you start running a train in the layout uh, area is to know what kind of throttle you're using. What kind are you using here today? Well, that's right, Chris. I see you use Digitrax on your layout, and you have a DT400 throttle. And what I'm looking for is I want to see what the important keys are. I want to see how I acquire a locomotive. I want to see how I can make it go forward or reverse. I want to know my direction areas. I guess a lot of people when they uh, come to a layout and they see a system they've never operated before, they get a little bit nervous or feel like a dummy if they ask somebody, you know, how do I acquire a locomotive? Is that, exactly. is that, is that a common feeling? I, I think it's even common among experienced models. Yeah. I own Digitrax on my layout, but if I run a layout with a lens throttle, I, I know the throttle is unique to mine, but it has many similarities, and it just yeah. takes a few minutes to get comfortable with it. And I ask the layout owner to show you how to operate the throttle, and then you'll yeah. end up in a comfort zone. I see you have two encoders here, so yeah. obviously I can control two trains, and I see there's a train in the yard there in Shelby Yard, and it's already addressed 5608, and I check my train. I think that's really important. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to find the, uh, the bell with the bell uh, button, press it, to see, okay, I know that that's the train. I'm just making verification. I'll blow my horn. There's the long, and I'll try the short horn button, and that works. And I'll make sure I have a light on. Okay, so now you're uh, sitting there, ready to depart to the uh, to the to depart for the main. What are uh, some of the things you want to do before you just head out? Do you just rush right out and get going, or what? <laughs> no, sir, Chris. The first thing I want to do is contact dispatch and request clearance yeah. to head out onto the main. And only when that clearance is granted will I uh, check my turnouts up ahead. That's critical. You just don't start running the train until you check what's happening ahead of you. Yeah. It's kind of like steering a car, in a sense. So I see that uh, the dispatch has given me clearance to start, but I'm not going to head out until I make sure that uh, I can get on the main. So I see the main is set for the main, but I need to set it for that track that I'm on in Shelby. So now that I'm set, my conductor set the turnouts, I'm going to blow the horn and I'm going to head out. I've got the bell on because I'm in a yard and the yard is where there could be some uh, employees working. And we're heading out onto the main. So another thing that you probably should do before you uh, leave is to check your consist against either your car cards or whatever to make sure that you've got all the cars you're supposed to have. That's right. Uh, always do. I check my uh, switch list. And in different layouts they could be uh, given to me in a different format. I may have be given a card for every car and I have to carry it in a pocket. Or I'll just be given a switch list and yeah. I'll just verify before I leave town. So knowing the cars that you have on your train gives you better preparation in terms of what you may be doing as you're going down the line. I want to know where those cars are going. Now this and one uh, is classified as a way freight. What, what does that mean? Well a way freight is a lot of general merchandise on this. I'll be stopping in a lot of places along the route. But if you excuse me Chris, before I leave town I'm going to set my switch back to the main now that I left Shelby Yard. Well, my conductor, if I'm the engineer, my conductor would do that for me. He'd yeah. be carrying the lists and that. So this train will be going around the layout. It'll be uh, traveling uh, to all the different places on the layout, and it'll be dropping traffic and picking up traffic along the route. Okay, thank you for that. Uh, it sounds like it's going to be quite an interesting train. Maybe uh, what we'll do now with that train is look at some of the problems that it would encounter and sort of familiarize the audience a bit with uh, some of the thinking processes to simplify what's going on. For sure, that'd be great. At the uh, yard throat here at Shelby, and soon there will be a way freight approaching, one that Mike's operating, and what we're going to do here is go through some of the thinking that has to go on and preparation for and actually doing some drop-offs and pickups in this yard. That's right, Chris. Uh, the train I'm in control of is just coming around the big bend and about to enter Shelby Yard. So I've realized my train is too long for any of the uh, yard tracks, so I'm going to contact dispatch requesting uh, uh, permission and clearance onto the main and to use the main uh, as my switching track. Mm -hmm. So it's arriving here on the inside main. What are you also looking for uh, in terms of this train's arrival? Well. I've blown the whistle two or three times and I've got the bell on. Whenever a train runs through a large yard or a yard of any nature on a railroad, 
you won't have that bell going. There's a passenger station down there in the distance, but there are also yard employees working on coupling cars in the yard, and they need to be able to hear a train. So the bell has to be on at all times. So you can see that our train is too long for the, uh, for the sidings and uh, even for the main in town. So we're going to use the main as our, as our uh, switching lead. So how are you going to solve problems here in terms of being able to do your switching and still allow access for other trains that are needing to get through? Uh, that's a critical question, Chris. We don't want to have any trains coming in Shelby from either direction coming into the back end or the front end of us. So we will reroute traffic using the crossovers outside of Shelby uh, in both directions. Okay, so let's go and set those switches. So Chris, we're at the crossovers on the double main line uh, to the north of Shelby. So uh, we're on the inside main with our train in Shelby Yard. So we want to reroute traffic off the inside main and we want to take it to the outer main there. So any trains coming along the inside will be routed uh, around our traffic. Yeah. And if there's trains approaching on the outside main, you'd want to make sure that that uh, switch on the outside main is still set uh, so that they can go through. That's right. Yeah. Okay, great. And there's still another end, obviously. We have to go to the south end of Shelby. So, uh, we're to the south of Shelby, and here's the other uh, crossover on the main. So here's the inside main where our train is residing in Shelby. So I want to throw the switches from the inside to the outer main to reroute traffic. So trains will be safely rerouted around our train and they'll be on the outer main going through Shelby Yard while we're yeah. residing on the inner main or the inside main. Now this is kind of known as a, in a similar circumstance when you only have a single track main line as sort of a passing siding circumstance. That's right, yeah. So we're, we're ensuring that uh, the traffic flows and that there are no collisions on the railroad. Okay, that's great. So what I'm going to do now is uh, complicate matters uh, a little bit by allowing a train to actually flow to that outside and we'll see what's happening. Oh, be so fine. now you're at that uh, crossing, uh, the important crossing, and uh, there isn't a train that's approaching and will be uh, needed to be rerouted. That's right, Chris. I see that there's a long cold drag coming. It's in the southbound direction, but we don't want it on the inside main, so we've thrown our uh, turnouts at the crossover here, and we're rerouting this train, and it's going to the outer main, farther away from where we're standing. And it'll safely bypass us at Shelby Yard. I guess the other thing is, is it's coming out of a yard down here. What are we going to have to do uh, with the tail end here? Well, the crew that's operating this train, when it uh, leaves the, uh, the long lead coming out of the yard, we'll have to throw this back to the main. There's a turnout right here, just past the road. And once the last car goes, the conductor on that train will ensure that that switch is, uh, is turned. Back to the main. And I've thrown it back to the main for safekeeping. Now the operator of this train, he's going through this double crossover that's been set for him. What happens here after it goes through? Well, once the train's finished, uh, the crossover will be set back to the main. It's pretty important because there may be another train coming on that outside main that will have to use that. That's right, Chris. And uh, that's a cardinal rule of model railroading. Always set turn your switches, your turnouts back to the main once you've gone through anything. Or you've done your work. Yeah. And if you're occupying it, you make sure those other guys know about it. Yeah, it's called communication. Very important the coal drag again Chris and as you see earlier we set the switches back to the main uh, outside of Shelby to the south and here's the coal drag and it's returning back to the inner main or the inside main where it, it belongs and where it belongs as it reaches uh, the yard in, uh, in Edmonton. That way it avoided your train completely and you now can get around to doing your work. And this train has its commodities going and uh, we didn't uh, stall traffic at all. So here we are at the uh, front end of the, of the train here at Shelby Yard. And uh, Mike is going to do a, a switching sequence. Uh, what's the first uh, steps that you really want to do uh, before you start moving the train? Well, I want to look at my switch list to see uh, which cars I have to lift out of Shelby. Mm -hmm. And I've identified the two cars. They're in the train. I see this Boston and Maine car. And I'm just looking at the last three digits, 045. Even though it's 79045 on my list, it's easier and quicker to just check the last three digits. 
This uh, Duluth, Winnipeg and Pacific box car, DWMP, last three digits 646. So these are the two cars I've identified that I have to lift. Okay, so did you look at your list to see if you had anything to drop off? Oh, I sure did, and I, I have a couple of cars to drop, and they're real box cars. And I see them further back in the train, but normally I'd make the cut behind the farthest car in the back, but I'm not going to walk all the way down the yard. That would take too long. So in tandem with my engineer, I'm going to ask him to move ahead and bring those cut of cars forward. We've blown the horn to indicate that we're on the move and we've got the bell going in the yard. So the other nice thing about this is that uh, with the train so difficult to see with the tracks uh, occupied in front, you're not really too concerned about the car number until it becomes visible down here. That's and you can crazy. double check that, eh? And I've, I've looked, I just perused the whole train and I know what a railbox car looks like. It's the bright yellow ones. And uh, the only drops for Shelby are the two railbox. So of course I'm going to be making my cut yeah. behind the second car. Now drawing the whole train here before you uncouple, there's an advantage to that obviously in terms of just time and space. Well certainly, and for my brakeman, he's not walking the full length of the yard. I'm doing the walking for him as the, uh, as the engineer. And I've discovered the car and my brakeman's going in and he's uncoupling. Okay. So once we've uncoupled, I know I've, I'm very comfortable with the yard lead north of Shelby. I won't crash into that train that's going by because I have a, a lengthy yard lead. All right, so um, one of the things that people talk about all the time and it kind of gets them upset is that when they're in this circumstance, what is the order of events? I mean, there's so many issues with terminology. You've heard of things like cherry picking and so on and so forth. Uh, what is a cherry pick and why do you want to avoid it? Well, that's a very good question, Chris. Uh, cherry pick is where you just pick the first car behind the engine that's one of your, your drops and then you pick the second one and the third one you go on. By doing that, by picking the easiest one first, you're actually wasting a lot of time. Okay. What you want to do is you want to go to the farthest car in your train that has to be dropped. Okay. Make the cut there, pull forward, and then you're, you're saving a lot of moves. And I guess that's the same thing in terms of your lifts as well, right? Eh? Totally. Okay, so you've identified your lift there. Is the, what's the deepest lift that you have to do? Well, I've got my Boston and Maine here, and i got my DWMP here, so this is my deepest lift. So I'm going to go, when I get, on, get the train on the move, I'm going to go and make my cut behind the DWMP. Okay, so let's uh, do that now then. You're going to pull this obviously forward. So, yeah, I'll just give it a two on the horn. And like I said, the yard lead is long enough that I'm comfortable that I'm not going to be interfering with those trains on the outer main. Mm -hmm. And once I clear the, uh, the switch at the yard throat there, I'll be able to turn the switch. And if you look over here, Chris, you'll see that the train has plenty of lead left. Here's my locomotive here. And my lead goes all the way up to here, which gives me a considerable amount of space and I'm comfortable with the switching. So it's always good to know the length of your train and the length of your farthest path. Okay. So now you've uh, pulled your cut uh, forward of the yard throat and you're going to now do some sequences uh, in order to get your cars and drop them off. So what are you going to do here, Mike? Well, I'm going to align my switches, have my conductor go in and align my switches down to the specific track. Mm -hmm. I have to go in, so I've thrown my switch off the main, and then I see we have the, uh, the first track here. That, uh, so you're going to go into the, the interchange track then? Yes, that's right. And I'm going to blow the horn, yep. one short toot, and uh, we're heading in onto the interchange track where we interchange traffic. Mm -hmm. So you're going to hook on to this uh, big long string of cars and pull it forward again to try to reduce the distance so your poor switchman doesn't have to walk Yeah, my miles. switchman would be standing about here. Yeah. And he's going to say five ties, three ties, you're on the pin, yeah. good to stop. And then he'll radio the engineer, say good to go ahead. And he'll pull the whole cut out and we're looking for the farthest car. And we see there's our Boston and Maine and there's our DWMP, which is our farthest car. So we want to make our cut after the farthest car. We don't want to cherry pick and get the B&M car first. We'll be giving ourselves extra moves. So that old switchman doesn't have to move very far. He's getting no, old, he's eh? Still, he's still standing here. Yeah. Not that he's lazy, but 
Why bother expend the energy? Yeah, and time is money. On the railroad. And you find that the locomotive doesn't have to travel as much. That's right. Less wear and tear on everything. So when you're uncoupling there, I have a question just before we Good. pull ahead there. Yep. These uh, little sticks that you're pushing into the uh, coupler pockets, I know that some layout owners get a little peeved off because of the pressure people put on them and they, yeah. you know, they're worried about the coupler getting busted or whatever. Yeah. How do you do it in order to sort of keep it nice and easy? And well, I find, Chris, I just go down right at a 90 degree angle yeah. uh, and perpendicular put it right in the coupler pocket. I just put my finger on top of the box car in behind and just shove it forward slightly and by pushing forward it'll release the coupler and then I pull the engine forward as you mm -hmm. saw me do there and uh, So what you're doing is creating some slack there so you can actually right. get the stick in the hole. That's right, exactly. Yeah. And, uh, and you're always taking care. If it's your own railroad you want your visitors to be gentle with your equipment you're taking care to be gentle with their equipment as well, with the host's equipment. So why are you doing the uh, the, the poles first, the pickups well, first? Well, we made the cut behind our drops already. I know where my drop is, so it's easier for me to keep in my head where the rest of my train is. So I've come out of the throat, and I'm going to drop that DWMP. Yeah. And I know the uh, there's a car in between that and the other car, the LVN, the Lion Valley Northern. I'll... Uh, I'll know that he has to go back into the yard. Yes. I guess the other thing too is, is that it allows you to uh, open up some space in that uh, that track that, where you want to do your drops. That's so that right. yeah. if, if you did your drops first, you'd be doing double the work. That's right. And you'd have half the space. Exactly. You always want to do it as efficiently, like a, a chess game. You want to do yeah. it in the least amount of moves and involving the least amount of space. Well, there sure doesn't seem to be much stress and pressure doing it this way. Very relaxing. And the other thing I noticed, too, that even though uh, you know we're doing a bit of work here, it's happening quick, but you're not running your train back and forth at 90 miles an hour. No, you want to do it at a realistic speed. and. Uh, and again, you want to uh, be respectful of the host's uh, equipment on their layout as well. And you go to freight yards, and sure, sometimes they, they might show off a little bit, but typically they're, they're careful. They don't want to damage the, uh, the coupler pockets down on the real gear. So this LVN we don't need, so I'm putting it back in the cut on the interchange yard. Give it a little push there, right? Eh? Yeah. Is that just to make sure that they don't recouple? Because I know gravity is not your so, friend some, sometimes. Sometimes that happens, yeah. yeah. Now this railroad though is built on the flat, so there's not much chance of that. Yeah, you, you were wise to do that. My railroad's also built on the flat. And we also have to lift the Boston and Maine car. A little to the horn always before you head back. And by making the cut behind my drops, I see I've got my rail box cars there. They're all ready to go in the yard. They're all ready to go in the yard, but I know that the cars in between my two lifts also belong in the yard. They don't well, go on my train. that's then you don't uh, get confused. Eh? That's right. I've Sometimes when you say, oh my gosh, where did those cars come from? But if you always follow the same procedure, the way you choose to do it, and Chris and I have this simplified procedure that we like, and it works all the time, we never are confused about cars that are on our train. Yeah, because you always know if you put your drops in last, you'll know where to do the cut. That's right. And the rest, well, the heck with it, it just happens. Exactly. It too just much falls. information is too much information. Exactly. Unnecessary. And it makes it fun. So now you're just pushing everything back, including your drops. Yeah, and my drops are the two rail box cars. Got my rail box cars safely in the yard. I'm going to make my cut, and then I'm going to pull out. And once I back this, uh, these long tank cars onto the train, I'll have my train ready to head out of Shelby. I perform my drops and lifts. Well, that sure didn't seem stressful. That well, was a lot of fun. And this will repeat itself in another classification yard, another town along the road. Okay, so um, now that we've gone through this sequence, let's see what happens in the big yard and talk a little bit about 
some of the complex switching problems. Excellent. And, uh, a little bit of a summary and conclusion of what we learned about uh, what goes on in a place like Shelby, uh, some of the things that you really want to watch for. Well, the most important thing is when you're coming off either of the main lines and you're entering Shelby Yard, you ought to make sure if you're a main line train passing through that your tracks are lined up to run straight through on the main. Uh, if you're switching and you need to use the main if your train's really long, you want to ensure that dispatch is okay that you can use the main line to switch and you want to set your uh, turnouts to the north and the south, your crossovers, to allow traffic to go around your train. And then when switching out in the yard, you want to know which tracks are free, where you have a clear alley to drop cars and lift cars. And there's a lot of industries here as well that you have to contend with as well. I think also, too, when you look at the actual switching itself, you don't have to get your brain wrapped around of identifying every single car in the yard to figure out what you want. Just the farthest car, and you start from that. As Chris yeah. says, no cherry picking. Don't take the first car, because you'll be going back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. Take the farthest car, then you've got all your cars in the string, and you work from the farthest on back and work your way front yeah. to the engine. Yeah, and let's get those lifts everything. done first. Eh? That's right, of course. Get yeah. the lifts done, clear up things, and then perform your drops.